there is a literal powerlifting cycle. The, the, the first one to three years, you go with a big name coach who offers you almost no value. You get down to the third, second or third year, you realize it's a bunch of garbage and you move on to somebody else that's known as a high level coach. And then you go to that high level coach and then, you know, you get a little bit more value for a little while. And then you realize you're all alone there too. It's a cycle. It's a, it's a straight powerlifting cycle. All righty, welcome back to episode seven of The Hunt. Today, I'm joined by my host, Benny Roberts, but also joining us from across the other side of the world, I am joined by my coach, David Shelton, formerly known as DShell underscore 11. How are you, mate? How's it going? Good, bro. Um, mate, first question, why are we doing this at 2 a.m.? Oh, well, I mean, I am up at 2 a.m. I mean, <laughs> to... to... To put it very shortly, I'm I'm always up at 2 a.m. Right. So, and yeah, he's not lying because I um I usually train like around this time as well, like during the week. And mate, the the response times that I get, I just like I just don't understand because yeah, you respond quicker than what I do, and I live it in the same time zone as my current clients. So yeah, I guess like first and foremost, how do you how do you manage? I guess your life, I guess living it that late in the that late in the day. Well, so a lot of it started when I was in college. I I was just like a night owl type of person. So I would always do everything at night and uh, I would intentionally not have any classes early in the morning and just structure everything around that just because I operated better at, at night. Yeah. Um, you know, fast forward and a lot of other people kind of operate this way. A lot of their workouts and things happen more in the evenings than they do in the mornings. Most people that I knew, they, they weren't really morning people either. So, um, whenever I started getting a little bit more into the, you know, coaching and, or things like that, it actually just continued. It just, the, the same thing from college just kept going on. So mm -hmm. I, I essentially, you know, started taking on more people and then, you know, I decided, okay, international, Right. And because you guys are so far away, all the way across the world. And I started realizing that if I do things at night, it's technically almost like they almost run and work together the same way mm -hmm. as the people that I take care of at night. So, so what happens was, you know, you guys are more at the bottom half of my day, whereas I start my day closer to like noon or even like, 2 p.m. and then I run all the way until 2 or 3 a.m. Yeah. So that's kind of um, you know, because I don't have anything going on earlier. So yeah. everything's just kind of flipped like that. <laughs> yeah, you're living the dream by the sounds of it. Okay. That's good. I I also went to uni and I would say that like my lifestyle was quite similar. Um, and I got a little bit of a smack in the face when I first started working full time because I did have responsibilities in the morning um, and that was really hard adjustment, but um, it's cool to hear that you obviously sounds like you live the life that you want to live, mate. And it's really good. That's good. I was going to say next question, mate. Like um, I think a lot of people want to know who D shell is because they, not many people in Australia actually know who you are. Um, they only just know you as my coach really. And when people ask like, who's D shell. And I think, yeah, good introduction, mate, would be, would, wouldn't go astray. So I guess, where did you start? Where have you from? Where were you born? Have you moved around much at all? And um, what I guess has taken you to where you are right now? Well, a lot of stuff there. Um, so I essentially was born in Texas, you know, raised in Texas, maybe about an hour away from where I am now. Um, and, you know, went to school, did everything like a regular person did, you know, go to school, want to get good grades, want to do all the educational route, all that stuff. Um, played a lot of sports. Um, that's for sure. Everything from soccer. I played ice hockey seven years, uh, basketball five to seven years, collegiate ultimate Frisbee. I was really into that. Um, really into volleyball as well. Yeah. So I have background in all of that, uh, even before entering, you know, powerlifting. Uh, went to school for mechanical engineering, 
uh, I got to the very end of that and said, well, I have an opportunity to do something uh, and something I really like to do, or I have an opportunity to do something and something that I think I would get old really fast and, <laughs> and really just hate it. So yeah, I sort of just jumped. I said, there's no, there's no reason to do something that you don't want to do. Yep. So uh, the only time you would do that is if you don't have any other option. Uh, I got to the point where I saw myself getting somewhere or having an option. Um, so that, that's kind of whenever I, uh, I opened the gym mm. and I, I had a few other partners with me that said, you know, we're just going to jump now. And, you know, I, and, and I didn't even, I decided not even to graduate. I had a few credit hours left. I think I only had 12, 16 hours left, three or four classes left. Right. That engineering degree. They literally were like, we're going to open it now. And I was like, well, it's now or never. And I can always go back and do an hour here or three hours here, three hours there. We, you know, just do it. I can always go back to it. I don't yeah. have to, I can just, you know, and I was like, but I need to see what this is about. Yeah, so, sure. um, did that. And, uh, I even took a few classes, like going in through that process. And I was like, nah, there's no point. Yeah. Uh, Jim started doing better. Everything started going better. My coaching started going better. Yeah. Everything just sort of aligned and I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that part anymore. Yeah. So, um, that's kind of how I transitioned from one thing to another. And that's also why I was able to go from a college hourly lifestyle to a coaching hourly lifestyle that were seemingly the same, the same is because yeah. I, yeah, cause I, I did, I've done, you know, your classic regular work schedules, but they weren't, they were like more early college or like end of high school. I did some of the, I did work for somebody at one point. So, uh, mm. like I have an understanding of, of waking up early and needing to do all that kind of stuff as well, but not what I wanted to do, not what I liked to do. Uh, that's for sure. So, yeah. um, that's good. I'm just I one of those kind of people. If I can do it though, I will, I will try my best to do what I want to do. Right. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. That's good. I was, um, I think Benny's the only one here who's actually graduated from a degree and followed through with it, mate. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you want to feel undermined, welcome to the club. Nah. But um, I think I think that's the one thing that I look for, man, in a coach, like is who I resonate with on not just like an athletic, like an athletic level, but like someone who understands, I guess, like what I've been through. And you didn't know this before I started, but you have seen since our last few conversations, the pros and cons list that I had between the coaches that I was deciding with. <laughs> and we won't go into that into detail, but, but one of, one of the pros that you, that I definitely look for that is just like a general marker is like someone who's had similar life experiences um, when it comes to, I guess, finding that coach and that person that you want to work with. And I think when it comes to, you know, life events or how you transition and move through your life, I think, we are very similar in that regard. We got to the end of a degree. We decided to pull the plug, do our own thing in lifting. And I get a lot of, and you probably don't know, I guess, like a business related motivation from someone like that. And that really helps me just back what I'm doing. Cause you obviously are quite successful with what you're doing at progressive overload and with your own business as a coach um, yet to invest some money into some spreadsheets, but we'll get to that later. Um, but at the end of the day, like I get a lot of motivation from someone like yourself. So I'm very happy to have crossed paths with you. Um, but as for yourself, like what do you look for in a coach? I guess when you're um because obviously right now you don't you're not coached by anyone, but what are you what are you looking for? And is that something that I guess you would look to dive into eventually? Well, okay, so right now I don't have a coach. Uh that that's what uh Aiden is alluding to. Uh I've had two total coaches across a competitive uh, powerlifting career since around end of 2015. So I've only had a grand total of two coaches the entire time. So I'm so from a very uh, primitive perspective, you can realize that I'm not jumping around or trying to, you know, I sort of tend to find somebody that I really think is going to be good. And then I I'll try and stick to it as good as I can. Like I'll just try to, um, you know, and over time I've started to, you know, me, myself being a coach and seeing the different types of coaches that have come out, uh, at, in the U S internationally, et cetera. Um, I've gotten to this weird, uh, I don't know if it's like a bypass or some sort of like area where I can't figure out what the best type of person is for me, because like, 
I tend to be the type of person that only just needs a good conversation with somebody. Uh, I don't, I, I don't have to have everything just totally laid out or there's a whole ton of things that have to be talked about. I I'm usually pretty self-sufficient at this point. Um, so I, I run into a weird crossroads between, uh, there's, is there somebody that can bring something to the table that I don't already have? And then is there at the same time, am I going to be wasting this person's time and my time potentially even just by asking? So, um, there's a lot of things that, you know, come into play as far as that goes, but essentially what I look for in a coach, ironically, is the thing that I give as a coach, which is conversations, valuable conversations and actual, well, we call it, we call it value, right? The word is value. Uh, and then understanding that each person has and derives value in different ways. So I have athletes that are just starting out. They've been powerlifting maybe a year and there's a lot of time that I have to spend on technique and on explaining the process and a lot of more, what we call like the beginning stages. Right. And then I have people that have been doing it for a really long time where we, we have the ability to talk about much, either much greater things or even not have to talk a whole lot at all because we're so easy to understand each other. So for me, success as, as far as coaching goes is understanding what people want, where they are in their actual powerlifting, like journey, life. Yeah. Life journey, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and kind of being able to facilitate the actions of that. So, um, I'm just looking for the same thing that I'm, I'm giving, if anything, yeah, you just offer a uh, night at the end of the day, basically at that point, um, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, we, we will look at it together and I've, I've told people all the time. I've literally jokingly mentioned that, like, literally I, I'm the easiest person. Somebody, I would literally pay somebody 200, $250 a month just for one, not even a weekly check-in. You could, you could give me something. And if I thought it worked, I wouldn't even bother you. And I would just, you know, everything would be fine. You know, I'm yeah. the easiest $200 a month. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's what I've said. Yeah. Um, just keep the deadlifts but, uh, above five reps. Yeah. That, that's the thought process, right? You know, just <laughs> <laughs> man. <laughs> but, uh, well, Benny's got another question for you, mate, that can probably like allude to what you were saying just then. Yeah. So like, obviously right, yeah. you, you work with a lot of people internationally as well. So um, I suppose the first question is what's the difference between American and Australian clients. Mm -hmm. And then if you can expand on any other countries that you think are interesting as well. Uh, so actually I only have, I have two people in Canada. I have two people in Hong Kong, almost three. Uh, one of them is starting in a month and then I have you and Dave. So I only have grand total four to five international athletes that you, that I would call international yeah. because like in Canada, I, I mean, I guess it's different, but I don't think it's really that different. Um, I will say that internationally, the actual, it, it's, I don't know if it's like a learning curve or it's like, uh, I don't know what to call it, but essentially most of the people in America that I pick up, they, they tend to have been following powerlifting for a really long time. And they have a knowledge of all these American coaches and all these, it, I don't know. It, it just feels like the world is larger in America as far as powerlifting goes. Yeah. It's like a big it's like a big situation. And I would even say Canada feels like it's almost being pulled in into that as well. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, I've had many conversations with people uh, from Australia and then also from Hong Kong, and they all tell me they're like, dude, our coaches are really primitive or our coaches, we don't have very many good ones. And then the ones that are really good are just packed tight. Yeah. You know, um, and especially in Hong Kong, my buddies all the time, they tell me that TSG has overrun them and all different kinds of things. And everybody's getting run into the ground by certain old school methodologies and things like that. Yeah. And uh, it's very funny. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but I think it's slowly growing. Uh, I, I don't really know where to put the time, actual time scale on it, on how 
I wouldn't even say it's behind uh, at all. I, I personally think with social media, you, you can catch up really quickly, but it's, there's something about, and maybe it's just, maybe I'm from Texas where Texas is just even bigger on powerlifting, but I'm just like around it constantly. And it's very like in my face. I don't have like, like it feels very in my face. Yeah. Whereas um, like I, I'm told uh, in Hong Kong and in, in other places, the, the powerlifters that I know, as far as, yeah. as far as they've told me, they've told me that there's not a whole lot of good information and there's not uh, these methods are, they're coming, but they're not quite there yet. Yeah. So, so um, that that's what I've seen. Yeah. So. I, I think, I think, yeah, like this alludes to my next question. So like, do you believe that there is a shift in the quality of programming and where do you think this direction of programming is taking us? So for example, since I started getting coached by you, I found that finding what rep ranges benefit some people compared to others are more effective than just like the straight up periodization style of programming. Yeah. So basically, like you're you're essentially asking like, is there like like you're figuring out that there are are you saying that there's higher like you're saying. Like, yeah, can you so, explain for, so as an more? example for like the shift in quality of programming that I've been like literally taught by you over the last like 15 weeks, I've mm-hmm. learned that like there's more to it than just periodizing your program because there are certain people that respond really well to say like volume all the time or other individuals who respond to like higher intensities all the time. It just depends on, I guess, the type of a weight class, height, gender you are, but do you see that there's a shift towards that now? The fact that you just alluded to how Hong Kong and I guess um, yeah. Australia are very oh. primitive in that sense. Oh, definitely. Oh, I didn't mean to say. I didn't mean. Like, <laughs> no. I didn't mean it in that way. I promise. Um, so, I mean, a little background on this. So, for example, whenever I first started powerlifting, it was 2013. Candido was making videos. I saw Pete Rubis deadlifting in his garage and doing crazy, you know, more old school things as well. And I saw a big shift happen maybe two major times, like once in 2016 and another time in around 26, 2018 and 2019. Um, 2016 is whenever everybody started periodizing things. 2018, 2019 is whenever it actually went almost backwards a little bit till before 2016 in, in a more linear way, linear, if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah. So it literally went from really complicated to like all this crazy, fancy DUP. I do this alternating something, something, something. And and then all of a sudden, Mike Tushier comes out with some emerging strategies. And then everyone starts tipping back in a linear fashion. It was crazy. (laughs) Um, So, so as far as, you know, I guess you're saying our, is everybody picking up on it? I would say absolutely. Yes. I think it's going crazy of anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think what it's doing is it's actually bringing more more people to powerlifting as a result. Um, because we used to almost categorize people in this primal fashion, Mm -hmm. you know, originally when I first started, you needed to be fat, you needed to be fat and you needed to keep eating in order to get stronger. Right. Uh, and usually whenever you're pushing something in a linear fashion, eating tends to help that. Um, so those two just tended to go together. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, then 2016 came along and said, oh, well, you can be smaller and 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 totally do what big people can do too. And then there was a big craze around 2016 where powerlifting just blew up in America. Yeah. That's like right around when I opened my gym. And I literally remember... USA powerlifting, like tripling in memberships that year, just, just that year alone, like it just blew up. Yeah. And, um, you know, so as far as that goes, you know, everything comes full circle now. And now we realize that not only is there a shape or a size, there's no shape, there's no size, there's no, there's no nothing. There's just simply what works. Yeah. Like I have an athlete that's 110 and is going to act like a 74 kg uh, a guy on squats, the dude will do sevens and eights and just produce progress from it like so easily. Yeah. And then you've got people that are on the opposite end of the spectrum where they're like 74 kg and then they can't, they'll only handle two or three sets a week on deadlifts. Mm. Cause that's it. How do you, um, so it's like, how do you sniff that out as a coach? 
Oh, okay. So are we talking about whenever we're starting, like whenever we start, right? So say for example, you just signed on a 110 lifter, like you said, and they okay. then the end result is that they respond really well to like how a 74 kilo lifter squats. How do you yeah, sniff that out and actually like yield that sort of result? Oh, well, that's, that's actually really easy. So what happens is, is this 110 lifter comes to me. He literally says, this is what I've been doing. And then I look at the numbers and I'm like, something doesn't add up right now because a 110 lifter can't be moving this, this quickly. You know, I'll see, I'll see something that just clearly sticks out. Like they'll literally move a set of three, almost the same way that they'll move a set of six. Or I'm saying like, they can just keep moving the same speed regardless of like, there's no drop off. Yeah. And then that's, that's the first sign, especially of a 110 being somebody that can handle more reps is they'll take a certain intensity and it seems like they can just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, so obviously if I'm in a four rep range, because my coach is old school and he doesn't do anything below five or he does everything below five reps. So I'm kind of stuck here, Mm -hmm. but I notice every time he would go down to threes, it would be about the same amount of productivity as fives. Yeah. Then I just say, okay, well, next block, we're just going to have some fun with it. And we're, I'm just going to do six. Like, I just, I'm like, okay, we'll do six. Yeah. And then all of a sudden five is the same as six. And then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, we just made progress, yeah. immediate progress because five is, if five is the same as six, I'm literally doing more. Yeah. And then all of a sudden six turns into seven. Yeah. And then you're like, on and then you're at 12 and, and you're <laughs> it's like, it's like, when is this going to stop? Yeah. You know? Yeah, but, um, that's good. And yeah, I think I think that moves into like I think more specifically for me because um like man like I, I I get a lot of questions like how how have you made such quick progress in such a short period of time because obviously like I had a two year plateau where I didn't improve my squat at all right and like I, you know how pissed off I was about that and um and I think I think. The biggest thing is that yeah, I was with you for when I hit my two sixty five. I was with you for probably I think thirteen weeks by that point. And I yeah. think why is it that after trying so many things to get stronger, um, why is it that the current thing that I'm doing is now working? If for example, high reps, right? So, so you're talking about high reps on the deadlift, or are you talking about higher reps on? Your well, brother, I was doing I was doing low reps all around, remember? Yeah, exactly. So, so you technically went high, but but your squat is definitely still low medium, and then your deadlift was high. So, just to explain a little bit about how your whole thing went, it was really simple. I literally went into your program, and I was like, "He's doing twos. He's doing threes and twos, and he's not even doing like ten reps a day." I was like, "So what?" I was like, "So what actually is going on here?" Is you know, obviously if you do something like that, you know, that's something like a super heavy weight or something, somebody who literally can't recover from a squat, uh, is doing right. So that was my first, uh, thought process. What I also noticed was that all of your squat days were pretty medium. Like they were, they were high. Like you were like, Oh, they're all high. And in my head, I was like, they're all medium. Mm -hmm. So like, so whenever I noticed that they were all medium, the first thing that came into my mind was all I have to do is create a primary day. Like, and I was like, okay, so all I have to do, right. Cause I looked at your weekly volume and, and, and you can count out, you know, for me, how, how many total reps of squats you were probably doing a week. Yeah. And I essentially put over half of your weekly volume, maybe, maybe even more than half of your weekly volume on one day. Yeah. I just put it all there. And then I was like, let's put it all in one spot. And then let's see if you have any left in a few days before your primary deadlift. And we'll, we don't care how low we have to go on there. We're just trying to get that squat volume in because we need it. And we don't really care how high it is. We just need that somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I gave you some belt squats and some front foot elevated stuff for security because of some of the past issues that you've had. Yeah. So um, that's kind of how I secured your whole thing is we essentially... I just, all I was really wanting to do was create a primary day. Yeah. Like I, I remember literally messaging Aiden saying, okay, on paper, this should work, but I don't know if it's going to work. It just should work. Like I just yeah. like, you it's know, and that hasn't been tried yet. Yeah. Yeah. 
dude, that's exactly my point. Like, and, and whenever it comes, especially with advanced lifters, I, I swear it is literally about trying things that should work, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the thing that athletes do all the time, you know, they, they, especially intermediates, you can, you can do a million things. There's a million things that you can change that will probably work. And it's like for advanced people like Aiden, like you literally have to look at the one thing that didn't work and, or the one thing that's clearly not working and just sort of go the other way because, you know, I've seen medium, medium, I've seen programs like yours. I don't see them very often. I'll be honest, but I've seen them before where everything is too medium. You're not giving yourself a chance to be strong on one day. Mm. Um, so we said at the beginning, when we started, Aiden said, I like high rep deadlifts. And I was like, okay, we're going to do high rep deadlifts as the constant, right? I said, we're going to go Monday, Thursday on the spacing of deadlifts. Mm -hmm. And I built the program around Monday, Thursday deadlifts. Mm -hmm. That's like literally what I, I went Monday, Thursday. It's like, okay. But instead I said, we'll do high reps on both days. That's the biggest thing I changed on that. And then I said, we're going to program the squat around that. Yeah. So I was, I didn't know how strong you would be on Saturday after a heavy Thursday. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take that away. So we're going to just put the heavy stuff on Monday. Yeah. I was like, that that's the only way that this is going to work because I don't know if Saturday is going to kill you. Your deadlifts are too heavy. I just didn't know. Um, I know a lot of people that can actually do heavy deadlifts on Thursday and still show up on Saturday for a really good spot. I, I just do. But given your your previous stuff, I was like, okay, let's put them farther away. Yeah. Just in case. Give us some security of some sort. And then and then we'll try it. Yeah. And and um, you know, and maybe this is my coaching style, or maybe this is, you know, just something, but I pay a lot of attention. Like I don't know how to put it that way, but like yeah. I'm looking to see how things are going. So um how do you fun go fact. about um with fun, the fact that fun fact you fun fact before that fun fun fact uh there's literally it takes two weeks to know if something is working i'll, I'll just say it right now i'm just gonna say it <laughs> and if any, anytime you make a change anytime you do anything two weeks is the number yeah literally right. anytime two yeah. weeks yeah so okay what week are you in benny or wait yeah week two he's in week two and we just scrapped it yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, but, there you go. but yeah, that's yep. yeah, it's, it's I I completely agree with that, and um, I think I think the other thing as well when we were talking about high rep deadlifts, and we've had a discussion about this before, um, and that seems to be flavor of the month or year, I guess, because everyone's doing sevens and eights, but some people don't actually understand as to why they're doing it, and it's like you said, it's quite simple. It's just how you respond to that volume, right? And I think. Yeah. What, what would happen if, say, for example, that person went and did low rep deadlifts if they were a high rep deadlift up? Because we've spoken about volatility before. Mm. So depending on how technique heavy your pull is or depending on how intensity sensitive your deadlift is, that can really make a big difference. Yeah. What makes high rep deadlifts valuable is you don't have to... The, it literally takes the intensity out of the situation. It literally says okay, you can be at intensity sen sensitive or not. And who cares? Because it's still light enough. Yeah. Like that's literally what it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, cause say you, say you pull, you know, 320, right. Isn't that, that's 700. So say you pull 700. It's like, you only have to take like early sixes to be there. Yeah. You know, it, whereas if we were doing threes or fours or something like that, it's like, okay, all of a sudden, I need to be almost mid, you know, I need to be much higher in order to elicit the same exact situation. Yeah. So you're getting more volume at like Walmart price, like basically bang for buck price. You're yeah. getting just more reps out of something that you can reproduce consistently. Yeah. It's just, it's just better. So. Yeah, yeah I agree. I feel like recoverability as well. Like um, a lot of people, and we've spoken about this before where, they say that deadlifts are the most fatiguing lifts, but I disagree with that completely. And so do you, because we've spoken about how we both get handed to it by squats, right? So I think yep. I think with high rep deadlifts, I think it's definitely like something of the future where we can actually like, I guess, lean in towards more to manage fatigue better and therefore create better programming outcomes. 
Right. So, and, and it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because um, anytime you have somebody that seems to not be recovering too well on the deadlift, it's like, you almost have to isolate it more to what do I actually need to progress? And then what can I recover from? So the answer almost becomes really simple because if you're doing threes or fours and your block ends in two or three weeks or even four weeks and you're just dead after four weeks, it's like, okay, well, maybe that's not the actual answer because you're literally frying out too early before you can even get, you know, to your desired outcome. Uh, whereas most people, when they do high rep deadlifts and they're, they're responding well to them, they, it's, it almost seems like they can add weight to the bar week to week without really seeing a whole spike in anything. So they can just continue to go on. So that's one of the tall tell signs of high, being good at high rep deadlifts is whenever you do them, you're able to seemingly just add weight to the bar every week, much like you just should be able to. Yeah. Um, you know, that's really what it is because it's light enough. It's yeah. finally light enough where I can add weight to the bar. That's really all it is. That's true. So. That's good. I think one last question on programming. Um, you mentioned how like some people get tanked after doing a heavy, say deadlift day on the Thursday, and then you want to ideally squat on the Saturday and bench on the Saturday as well. But for myself, for example, and for some other people out there, their primary sessions are earlier in the week. So how do you go about, I guess, preparing for a competition when, say, for example, your competition day is on a Saturday, but your primary squat day is on a Monday and your deadlift day is on a Thursday? Right. So so if you think about it, it's primary primary days in general, right? You're you have them spaced out. So you actually had a primary day on Thursday. Hmm. So so imagine if I was to tell you, hey Aiden, we're we're we just need to squat on Thursday. We, we need to do a squat on Thursday. I'm just going to take away your, uh, your Wednesday squats, or I'm going to pull them all the way down. And we're only going to do a little bit on, on Wednesday, if not any at all. But I wanted you to squat something pretty heavy on that Thursday. If you're capable of three, 320 plus, something like that on that Thursday, isn't that a primary day? Yeah. So your primary day is on Thursday. It's also on Monday. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So all I have to do to get you ready for Saturday is simply I'm only two days away. I'm not actually Monday to Saturday away. Yeah. If that makes sense. So we yeah. so would you so just rotate I'll, the days around? Right. And and because the thing is feeling strong, especially whenever you taper, it actually gives you more room than you think to feel strong. Yeah. Um so well, for example, um if you Say, say you're coaching somebody and they seem to be a lot more sensitive than others. You can always rotate all the days to where that squat primary lands on that Saturday or on that Sunday that they lift. You can always do that, like just to really solidify that that's going to be a strong squat day. Yeah. But I would say that, I mean, really bench is the only one that I would be really wanting that primary day to be on the day that you lift. Yeah. Um, just because there's so much, there's the more days you have just in general on anything, the more volatility there is. Mm -hmm. And if I'm strong on the day that I also bench four other days, I want that day to be the strongest because that gives me the most predictability. Right. You only deadlift twice. I don't need a lot of predictability. There's only two. Yeah. So, um, even if you bench sub 160, brother. <laughs> <laughs> 160 isn't even like. I, I don't know. I, it, I don't like I've been powerlifting for so long. Like if, if you bench 160, I think you're strong. So it's oh, just like, thanks, there you go. that's good. You have to do it, man. So, yeah, when, when you get there, when I get there, <laughs> when I, get there. I, I think first time I benched 160, I think it was 2013, 2014. Fuck. I think I weighed like 70. How was your reaction? Kilos. Uh, I don't know. The same as now. I just make no reaction. Just shrug it off, mate. Another day. I was almost fully flat back. I think I did a Larson 350 a few weeks after. So, like, that's how bad. Like, I was just pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's, that's, good. that's crazy. Day. I'm kind of on the topic then of, um, like, preparing athletes for competition. Do you have anything planned for the competitive season this year? For yourself? Oh, me, myself? Yeah. Okay. So, 
I haven't told anybody this. I haven't really just in general, like I'm not, I'm pretty private about, I guess my competing stuff. I, I was, I've always been private actually about it. I was just very predictable. I would always show up at nationals and I would always show up at the Arnold. That's what I've done for like the last seven years. Yeah. So I was just predictable. It wasn't that I was announcing it. I would never do any of that. I'm just pretty private about it. And I don't actually like competing as much as people think, Okay. I guess. It's just not my, it's just not, and I've also been doing it so many times and so long. Um, competitive stuff is just, it's like a test. It's something that you really need. And it's something that gives a coach an understanding of where you are. So um, for me, the only time, the next time I'm going to compete is when I have a coach. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to self-guide myself into a meet. I'm just not. Yeah. Like there's not, I'm just not going to do it. That's some, um, I don't know. I have no because idea. you feel like you find it really hard to make, I guess, not the right decision, but not be emotional about your decisions. Oh, well, well, as a lifter in general. So uh, I've had, I've actually talked to Steven a few times, Steven day about this a few times. I literally am like, if I don't have proper like coaching going into things, I try too hard. Like I literally I'm going to just run myself into a wall if I do things myself. I just know that about myself. Trying too hard is literally my thing. And I don't, I'm not good at not trying too hard. I just have problems with that. So, yeah. um, like, so for me, having a coach is, is basically having a plan and a direction, something, you know, something very simple. You'd be surprised how simple that is, really. But yeah. um, there's something about having a coach that, you know, you can be a really good athlete. You could be intermediate. Just, just having a coach in your corner is really valuable. And it, it really, you know, for me, at least if I do get a coach, I will want to compete because it is more a test for my coach and for me. Um, like for example, you went to nationals and when we started, I had a lot of good info based on your actual peaking block. So I tell people all the time, one of the greatest ways to you know, even look at programming is to look at a peaking block. Like look at, look at what happened when you found the limit, look at what that produced. Yeah. And then you can really find a lot of patterns there. That's the place that you want to find patterns. You don't want to find someone neck high in an off season block and you don't even know what they're doing. So, yeah. um, I'm just saying, so yeah, but yeah that's your answer. I I'm, I'm gonna, I need a coach. And if I get a coach, cool, I'll do a meet. Don't have a coach. Just keep doing my own thing. Keep growing the gym. I have a lot of things planned for the gym. Uh, plan on directing meets, plan on maybe moving, things like that. So I have a lot of things, just kind of actual non-me things that are that are going on in my life. So uh, just going to focus on what I can focus on. And if I get a coach, then maybe that will help me do some of that. So Yeah, for sure. Uh, that'll be good. Um, so yeah, speaking of the gym as well, like, so do you have many, um, face-to-face -face members there that you coach as well? So currently, and I don't know why some coaches don't really like talking about how many athletes they coach. I currently coach 35 athletes. Yep. So I have 35 people yep. and I would almost say almost half of my people are in person. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they're like some of my favorite people, like literally in person is my favorite type of athlete yeah like nothing nothing wrong with people across wherever but in person i convey ideas faster i it actually makes my job easier yeah. like I, I don't know how to explain it like i literally it almost feels like i have half the roster that i do because i see those people all the time yeah. like i'm able to actually keep a real running in face conversation with them about where their stuff is about Hey, did you remember this last time? Or even something as simple as, okay, I'll see you in two days about that. You know, I'll see you then, you know, type of thing. It really actually helps. There's a lot of quality uh, that can be had in an in-person experience. Um, and uh, I tell people all the time, if you have the ability, like say you have an international, uh, like say, say there's all these international people and then there's this one coach that's in person you're not super sure about. I say take the person in person and see what that's about because there's a lot of things that you could, there's a, just a lot of value that you can get in person that that just isn't there if, if you're if you're international. 
Yeah. Definitely. So. Yeah, for sure. For is, sure. is there much that you do like to fill, like I suppose the void then, or any tools that you use for your online clients because you can't provide that same face to face service? I'm bad. I well, I try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I try yeah. to be. That's that's literally it, dude. Like I I try to be fast. Uh, like I try to almost be. I try to almost be there enough to where someone knows that they can reach out to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I want, I essentially want my athletes to feel like if they have a question, they will actually make the attempt to ask. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I would say that's the biggest thing. Um, and I mean, there's, there's nothing that, that, that really can replace it. It's just like, I'll send video stuff. I'll do as much as I can, yeah. but, um, I will always say that if there's someone in person, there's, there's, that's always something to look at. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, so yeah, with, with your brand, like growing and everything then, and you've obviously got like a nice little clientele face to face, what's the direction for it and where are you wanting to go with the gym? Okay. So the gym currently is 2,200 square feet. Uh, I would dare say that a powerlifting facility, if you're over 5k square feet, it's really hard to actually run strictly powerlifting. Um, maybe you can get away with seven. Um, but anything really like large, you eventually actually have to start delving into other, um, you know, genres of, of lifting, maybe even do some CrossFit stuff in the morning or do have something else going on. Right. So Currently, I'm thinking about finding a spot that's closer to five, six K square feet where there's enough space for me but to be able to run meets. That's really the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, I've sort of gotten into this meat directing business more because the area that I'm in doesn't offer a whole many sorts of meets uh, yearly. Most of the meets are five to six hours away on average. Yeah, okay. Um, so you know, if a lot of my guys are going down there, I'm just like, man, if I have a space to just do this for my guys and for everyone in this, you know, vicinity, that's yeah. like the next thing to give, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Because as a gym, I only look at what I can give. So I'm essentially like, that's the thing. I have a ton of equipment, you know, I have a ton of, I have like just all this stuff and I'm like, okay, I'm the only guy that can bring this to this I, i'm the only guy that can create this right now yeah. so i need to yeah uh, so um that's more of what i'm looking at uh as far as coaching goes going to be fully transparent i literally someone could say david you know uh, i'm out tomorrow you know i could have half my roster quit on me whatever you know i i want only the people that desire to be coached by me to be coached by me i'm not trying to get 70 80 not not trying to do anything as weird as that sounds. Yeah. Um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get everybody that does work with me to do well. That's really all I care about. So, so if you do work with me, I'm going to try my best with you. I'm not going to go out and try and actively take all these new calls and all these, you know, I'm just not going to do that. That's just not me. So, um, and I've had a lot of success just by, you know, people that are coached by me, they do well. That's essentially how I actually get more clientele. They're just like, yeah, my coach talks to me like this often. Oh, my coach only talks to me once a week or my coach. I asked my call, my, my coach for a call, you know, last week and I didn't even get one or I didn't even get my program on time or it's been a month since or whatever, you know? Yeah. And it's like, they, they notice that there's a clear discrepancy of, of what they're getting versus what their friend is getting. Um, biggest thing that I, that I center myself around is progress. So, uh, that's also why I don't have a team. That's why I've never really been pushing towards having some sort of team. It's because I've seen, like, I've seen too much, maybe it's just America that's doing it to me or something, but I've seen too many of these teams and, uh, you know, they're making marginal progress yearly. And I'm like, but I'm a part of a team. It's like, okay, well, you know, when it, for me, whenever I pick up with somebody, I'm like, yeah, you were from that team, but you also made this much progress. Yeah. So now you're not on team, but we're probably going to make triple the progress Yeah. because you're actually focusing on yourself Yeah. and not that big name athlete that your big name coach had. It's like, okay. Yeah. It's, it's where you, so. it's where you only hear the cream of the crop really. 
um, with some of the big name lifters. Like, like there's, I can name off a handful of companies that are involved in coaching and anyone in Australia would absolutely love to be coached by that person, but only for the name, right? The reputation. Yeah. And then, so maybe you can speak on that more, but in my, in my opinion, like I, I've been an, I'm an athlete. Like, you know, I, I, I look for only one thing and, or maybe two things I'll say learning and progressing. And those are really the only two things that I, that I center myself kind of around. Mm -hmm. So like everything that I've talked about this entire time, whether it be coaching philosophies, whatever philosophy, any philosophy, everything goes back to knowledge and then progression. So there's only those two things that exist, either you're learning or you're growing, doing both, you know? Yeah. So I, I sort of center myself around that kind of stuff. I, uh, Dave keeps, you know, making fun of me that I don't have a shirt and I'm like, bro, I've never, I've never been trying to make a team thing. Like it's just not my thing. Yeah. Why, why can't you also go on Alibaba and buy some, you know, in our I mean, fucking tower shorts and put your name on it. Yeah. I have thought about it. I, I really have. Um, it's just one of those things that I'm just like, man, I, I've never really tried to center myself around a group thing. I've always just kind of kept my coach athlete stuff as like, a like it's more a personal thing. It's more actually I'm coaching you. It's, you know, type of thing. So it's like, it's like team D shell. No, it's, it's just David's helping you. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's that literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you do you find it? Do you find it weird how sometimes, like sometimes, like Dave and I give you shit for like not having a shirt, even Logan in some points. But like yeah. we, like it's. Do you find it weird how like it's kind of still going back the other way that we want you to know that we are part of your team and we are your your clients? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it. I don't find it weird at all because I think that so. This team, the whole, I'm not against team, by the way, like literally I've seen these teams grow up. I've seen people create genuinely good teams. Yours is a good example. Like I'm saying I've seen these, but what's happening is, is there are a lot of people that think that they're getting, say something like your team. And then they're actually getting something that is masking as a team. And just, they're not actually getting better they're not getting what they actually thought they were getting if that yeah. makes any sense yeah. so so you like the team for the right reasons whereas i'm almost anti-team over here because there's so many teams <laughs> that does that make sense i'm yeah, trying to literally it. not be the thing that that is perpetuated mm, yeah. so um but you guys actually like you know appreciating what i'm doing things like that that's yeah. that means a lot to me uh, on a, on a personal level. And, uh, it's, it's, that's the right kind of team. Okay. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. I'm I would, totally I would like easily that. say there are more probably like soul traders and like self coach people, not self coach, but people who just have like a, one person here in Australia, then there are teams like America by the sounds of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm finding out every single big name athlete that you've seen on ig by the way every single one of them has at least like 10 to 15 not even not even trying like literally they have 10 to 15 just because of who they are just immediately just literally dm for coaching yeah boom yeah. literally uh, all these you know whether it be high schoolers or, or just people within their first year of, of lifting you know they, they're just like okay I, that guy's really strong i need to figure out what he's on to yeah so yeah. And that's how that, that's actually how that works, by the way. Uh, I, I had mentioned in a group chat the other day that there is a literal powerlifting cycle. The, the, the first one to three years, you go with a big name coach who offers you almost no value. You get down to the third, second or third year, you realize it's a bunch of garbage and you move on to somebody else that's known as a high level coach. And then you go to that high level coach and then, you know, you get a little bit more value for a little while. And then you realize you're all alone there too. <laughs> and then you're in this weird situation where your high level coach doesn't even message you. <laughs> it's like, it's a cycle. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a straight powerlifting cycle. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's weird being a coach in that situation because I ironically tend to be in that third notch. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like a, a good third of my roster is in that third notch. <laughs> They've been through the 
not naming names. They've been through the uh, big name, yeah. you know, coach that was more just a lifter. And then they've been through the high level coach, you know, or high level coaching program. They've been through those two already. Yeah. And then they're just like, they're just like, well, I didn't get the responsiveness or I didn't get the knowledge or I didn't get something or I got hurt. That's a good one. I got hurt. <laughs> uh, so now David fix me. Oh yeah. I also want to learn. And oh yeah, I want to put 50 kilos on my total. So all of a sudden, <laughs> dude, it happens. It's so annoying too. It happens <laughs> all the time. Like, cause I don't mark it. Yeah. I end up being the, almost like the people's coach and be in the background every single time. So yeah. I, um, does the, does the, does the phrase the grass is greener get thrown around quite a fair bit over there? Oh, can you uh, elaborate? So like, for example, as you were mentioning, you've got that person who goes to say, for example, the high school dropout lifter who was really talented and they get coached by them and they move on to the higher level coach and then they get to that point and they think like maybe the grass is green over here and they hop over there, but the grass is really dry and the program is really shit. Like how much of that is over there in America? Uh, I mean, I would say the average, like it, whenever you get to that point, right. You're usually going to spend at least six months to a year checking to see how dry that grass is. Yeah. So, right. so I'm just saying like, uh, if, if, if you're going to spend that much time on it, it's like, does it happen? Yes. I've seen a lot of people move from, uh, certain coaches to other coaches and they just think that the grass is greener. Um, don't want to name names. I literally have names. Um, I <laughs> literally see people move and then they think cause they feel better and, or something, something that they are just doing better. And then you look at the yearly progression or you look at if they're getting smarter, you look at if they're developing anything of any sort and two years goes by and nothing happens Yeah, or they regress. Sometimes yeah. they regress. Well, I get injured. Um, Oh, that's a whole other thing. Injuries, regression, that whole thing is not fun. So, no. No. Um, but yeah, I think all, I think a lot of all of this is not the easiest thing to navigate through. Same no. reason why I'm having trouble finding a coach right now. It's not me understanding that is literally making me freeze. <laughs> like I said earlier in the podcast, it's making me freeze because yeah. I don't want to go backwards. No. Right? No. So that's kind of how that that's that's how that goes yeah. that's good i think I'll, I'll go one more question before we hop into our fast five questions which just goes over five minutes and we hit you with a quick question but last one and dave as in dave performotion asked me to ask this he says um why does aiden's spreadsheet only have one color and why does mine have a palette okay so <laughs> uh, that there are so many things here okay so i am super well known for my sheets having no colors. Um, I'm super well known for having it organized the way, you know, very organized, but just not have colors. Um, and I, I've seen people with like the most decorated thing ever. And then I look at the program, I'm like, well, it's garbage. So it's like, <laughs> so I'm just saying I've seen it all, you know, um, I think maybe it's the fact that I just haven't spent a whole lot of time actually decorating it out maybe it's the fact that it's team no team so there's nothing to actually put on there right um i've had the amount of athletes that i've had that have actually taken my program and decorated it themselves is actually a lot um Has so that, that that, that, uh no <laughs> literally they're harder to read they, I literally go in there and I'm like, man, this is so annoying to read now that you've put all these dumb colors everywhere. Yeah. Cause sometimes I'll color code some stuff just to like keep track of it. And then now I'm like, well, there's 50 colors here yeah. and I can't remember what color there was before. Well, but. I wouldn't even know what sort of scheme you would like. Cause I, I, we talk about motorbikes quite a fair bit and I know that you're Suzuki Jigsaw. It, what, what even color is that mate? Oh, so it's, it's a, forgot the name of it it's some sort of chameleon color chromatic of some sort but basically it's gray but whenever the sun hits it it's a rainbow so yeah. it basically oh, yeah. depending on how bright it is outside the more shiny it'll look so if someone yeah. like like if the sun was just straight down on it it looks very 
it looks like Mario Kart. Like you hit a star and you're just kind of like flying through and it's rainbow. Um, but I don't know, man. I, I don't have colors. I, I'm not a color person. Google uh, Sheets doesn't I, have chameleon. That's the, that's what you're trying to say. Yeah. The yeah. Point, I, I can't, I can't, uh, you know, I, I think that if Google Sheets came out with something where I could decorate it like a lot more, like put a video of them, of, of my athlete doing something ridiculously dumb in the background <laughs> that they did, I would totally do that because, yeah. uh, yeah. I don't know. I talk to all my athletes just so often that yeah. we're always running some sort of joke every time or something. And yeah. I think that would give it some personality, but yeah. I don't know if I put too much. Well, I, think, just... I think I brought it up with Dave, <laughs> like, bro, why the, because I'm a, I'm a big decorator. Like I I just, I just made new sheets, man. You know what I mean? And I, I take pride in the colors and all that sort of stuff. But I, um, <laughs> I think I asked Dave, I was like, man, what's the go with, my sheet looking so plain and yours looking so colorful. And he said, yeah, I literally told D shell that to make yours as bland as possible. Cause I knew it would piss you off. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. I totally didn't know that. That's so funny. That's so like, good. I, I, the thing is like, also whenever I'm making a new sheet, like it just, sometimes I'm in a certain mood and I'm like, and I'm, I just color it. It makes no sense, but, and then it just ends up that way. But That's so funny. Um, I actually created uh, uh, Dave's program from absolute scratch. Like, just wrote the whole thing, just like piece by piece. And then I was looking at it. I was like, coloring it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know why. It makes no sense. But I have other athletes that have colors in their programs, kind of like that. Yeah. Like you, you, you build something that. And for example, the other thing is Dave's program is something that I've literally never written something that wild before. Like literally, I've, I, I, after I got done writing it, I literally was like, I want to color it because it looks cool. Like that's essentially what happened with Dave's program. Um, because he, he, he told me about his background and I looked at the program that he was running and it took me three to five minutes to realize that I was going to have to write the whole thing all by myself. Yeah. There was no, there was no data. There was no data to get. So I had to just write the whole thing. So whenever I got done writing, I was like colors. So I don't know. Some it's people have mood. colors, some people don't. That's it. Um, now, on, on, um, I guess, mood, you're a big meme guy. Um, yeah. What... <laughs> What what what's the meme culture like over there? Because it's not very big here, believe it or not. Like I see Barrett, for example, like he's a massive following here in Australia. A lot of people love Barrett, like the stuff that he posts. Yeah. People think he's the funny, like he is he's God's funny. gift to Instagram over here because of the stuff that he posts. So Australia yeah. would have loved me like three years ago. <laughs> Every so if you scroll far enough back, I used to actually post a meme after every single one of my videos. Wow. So it would be me lifting and then I would create a meme and I would just put it at the end. And I, I actually <laughs> gathered a following, not even based on my lifts, but like they would just wait for the meme at the end. And if I didn't have a meme at the end, they would be like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> it's <know>? like dessert. <laughs> That's so mad. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. A lot of the, the, the meme culture has kind of not gotten as it's, it's been less fun for me over time because some of the memes I was like, okay, if so, is somebody going to be too sensitive about this? Or, you know, I'm just like, Oh, I don't want to step on this person's toes or this, this, I started getting old. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. Yeah. And like, I, I started losing, like, I started losing my creative flavor because like, I was like, Oh, am I going to offend this person or that person? Yeah. Instead of just having a good laugh, like I can't, yeah. you know, I don't know. So hence the bland sheets, mate, you know, you lost your yeah, flavor. Te- I'm literally posting. I like uh, hit a PR set of four. I hit one eighty five for four on bench yesterday. All I literally put on my caption was a little fishing hook. That's it. I'm just boring now. That's it. <laughs> I've, been, I've been just, I've been just doing the boring things. Nobody knows if I'm hitting a PR or if I'm just hitting a back down set, you know, my last no, back down set. No one know? knows. That's it. Yeah. Like, uh, like you remember that 245 I sent you, you remember I yeah. sent you that last rep and it was really stumbly. Yeah. That was a set of five. I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to send you the last rep. That's it. 
that's all I got for you today. So it's like, David, I'm guessing. A, it's I guess, but all right, we'll, yeah, we'll, get, we'll get in the fast five. So we, I'm just going to hit you with five questions. It won't take more than five minutes. But um, the first question is, is if you were to train for a different sport, what would it be? Oh, man, that's hard. Okay, so I'm old. I'm old, and what do I do when I'm old? Um, man, I, I might do... Really motorsports. Oh, I would not do motorsports. No? Nah? Absolutely not. I would be never... I would not even try motorsports because <laughs> I... I have a weird fear of, of as weird as it sounds as a, as a bike rider, I have a weird fear of literally dropping a bike on my leg or something happening and then just not being able to walk. So, um, so that my motorsport literally increases the chance of that by like a million. So, um, <laughs> I'd probably go back to beach volleyball. Honestly, I had so much fun playing volleyball and I was, yeah, I had hops. Um, I don't, I don't know what, what do you define as hops? Just getting high, man. Can you touch, can you touch, if you were going to like a general, I guess, like store, what's the likelihood of you touching that roof every time? All the time. All the time? (laughs) No, I had, uh, maybe not now, but um, no, I, so vertically speaking, right? Like what, what numbers are you thinking are hops? Like I do. We, like you, I don't know how to explain it, but like um, we've got that test one where you hit up and hit the pegs. Yeah, hit the paddle. Okay, yeah. Um, but I, I actually can't remember like what a respectable number is. Maybe you just say it, and then the the viewers can like they'll decide. They'll decide. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. Um, I did vertical jump training, uh, coinciding with my the beginning of my powerlifting journey. Uh, I increased my vertical from I think I started at twenty nine inch vertical. And I had a 42 inch running vertical by the end of that. that um, that's, that's pretty high, yeah? It's pretty high. Um, like, obviously, I'm not trying to compare to NFL combine stuff, but usually, if you have a 40, 42 to 45 year NFL combine type numbers, um, but honestly, like, I understand NFL type stuff. You have to be able to play football and jump that high. Mm. So it's like, so I understand that obviously it's skewed because I'm only working to jump high. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of people that have very large verticals, but they don't have the physicality to say, like, for example, play football. Yeah. So, um, could you dunk? So you playing wise, ball? I could dunk anything I can hold. So yeah. not the ball because literally the ball is way too large to palm, but yeah. I could dunk anything I could hold. I was getting about mid arm over the rim. So Fuck. yeah, I'm getting up there. Must be nice. Uh, I, I feel well. like, do you know what a, you know, when you go fishing, you know, when you put a sinker on the end of the line, mm-hmm. that's what I feel like when I jump, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds horrible. That, that's, that yeah, yeah. Sounds, yeah. I went, that especially when I go fun. swimming, mate, I'm definitely a sinker when I go swimming. I'm a sinker now when I swim. Dude. You're a sinker now? Yeah. I'm, I'm totally a sinker. I, I didn't used to be a sinker, but now I'm fat as heck. So basically... <laughs> That's kind of what happens, but, um, I used to be really lean. I used to, you know, I was in the 74 class for a little while. Uh, I placed athleticness over or athletic ability over really anything. Yeah. Um, didn't really care a whole lot about how much I actually lifted. Um, ended up, you know, doing pretty good at nationals 2017. I was like, well, dang, David needs to get heavier because this isn't cutting it. So <laughs> I went from fast to not as fast. And, uh, but now I lift more, so that's cool. Um, what about, um, post gym feed, mate? What's your guilty post gym feed? Oh man, that's hard. Um, I like pizza. I like fried chicken. I like you're talking to the bloke, you're preaching to the choir. I can go forever. Like literally like even, even like a massive burrito or something. Um, so I, Chipotle no, I is just huge eat. There, hey. it, Chipotle is massive. The thing is I've been going to Chipotle on average about two times a week. I actually went today. Um, they've hiked their prices up quite a lot. So I don't no, really, like everywhere's going up. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I think I just paid $22 for a bowl today. So, $22. Yeah, $22. 
So yeah, that's like that's literally that's like, like thirty five bucks. Like yeah. one, three bucks yeah. Dude, for one bowl. That's mad. Like literally, I was like, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> yeah, but change that to once back. a week, man, not twice. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go back to pizza or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's um something like that? What's your gamer tag? Game tag. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay, so oh, I play Call of Duty uh, on the off chance I get some time, and uh, my gamer tag is Wakanda Forever. Oh, that's alright. Nice. That's not Wakanda bad. Forever. Yeah. Um, but then you have to put. So I couldn't get it exactly Wakanda Forever. So I put Wakanda, and then it's the letter or the number four, uh, forever. And then I put hard H A R D because even so Wakanda forever hard. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Nice. That's yeah. better than Dave. You want to know what Dave's is? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Green lungs. What? Yeah. Why? Why? Hey, I don't know. It was 15. Probably saw his first Billy. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I just, I just made, made mine up because I just saw, I, I literally just got done seeing Black Panther and I was See, like, that, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I was like, well, kind of forever. And ever, everybody's going to think that I'm trying really hard at this. Like <laughs> literally every time I start doing good, people just yell like, man, Wakanda or Wakanda. And they just assume. <laughs> and then they just assume my race and everything. So that's fun. <laughs> What um but, what are some nicknames you have for clients and coworkers? You don't have to name them all, just a couple that stand out. So what do you call like? Uh, oh man, uh, that's totally redacted. Um, <laughs> literally, uh, uh, I don't have any actual names. Like I only know what. Usually, everybody calls me D Shell or or Dave, actually, um, or Shelton. Like back whenever I played sports, literally everyone would just call me by my last name. But no, I don't have any nicknames. We don't actually do a lot of nickname stuff. Yeah. Maybe do you guys do more nickname stuff? Yeah. Aiden has a nickname for just about everyone yeah. on earth. Yeah. 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 Really? Yeah. yeah. You're D Shell, you're pretty basic, but Ben's yeah. gnome because he's really <laughs> short and he's built like a gnome. You know what a gnome is? What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> really? How tall are you? Like five, six. That's yeah, I would appreciate. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> yeah. Bit, mate, I'm only five eight, so like I'm not far off also being a known. <laughs> yeah, but it just takes money. Man, that's so funny. Dude, <laughs> I, literally nobody. We don't have any nicknames for anybody. That's crazy. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I, I'll I'll think of one for you. Yeah. Uh, what about what about some unwritten rules with where you work? So obviously at POD. Do you have any unwritten rules? Um, so we have one written rule, which is obviously just the equipment rule. Um, we essentially have Eleco plates, and then we have a whole bunch of Rogue and uh, Hansu or just other types of plates. So we essentially just squat and bench with the Eleco plates, and then we save everything else for, for deadlifts. Um, so that's the written rule. The unwritten rule that I would say, which I mean, honestly, this is just a powerlifting unwritten rule, is when somebody's going for the top set, you essentially want to stay more than like 10 feet away from their actual field of view. And then you don't move. So essentially, <laughs> we don't want anybody walking in front of us during top sets. Yeah. And then we always stay... Like for me, I try and just stay out of sight. Like when my athletes are hitting top sets, my face is never in the view. I'm I'm always behind or I'm always like far away because I don't want to break that actual concentration. Yeah. So you've, you've made a comment before when I've sent like a top set through and I've got, mate, there's more than people walking in front of me. Like I've got people throwing ammonia in my nose, they're yelling, they're screaming, oh, they're cursing and you're like, man, yeah. I, I would love to be there just for probably one session, but then that will do. <laughs> yeah, I, I was yeah, doing. That's, that's crazy. I was doing my tertiary squats at the end of my. Um, this D, is good. D, at the end of my what, what was it D, DBS day, and um, it's literally like nothing. It's like nine at RP three, 
and I've just unracked it and Aiden's got like literally seven of the boys to just form a circle around me and just start screaming. Like you know, <laughs> that was probably the easiest first year day you ever had. Though. Oh man, it was easy as soon as I stopped laughing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I think it really depends kind of how you are as an athlete because like for me, I the yelling and all that stuff, it it sort of just breaks like my focus. I don't know why. Uh, but I think in a genuine sense, like I would like it if that makes any sense. Um, because you know, I've seen just a, in a lot of situations, people just start to make noise just to make noise. And then you start listening to the noise and then all of a sudden you're super distracted. So mm-hmm. I've, I've gotten to a certain point where I just try my best just to keep it as constant as possible. And constant for me has turned into headphones being in and me just saying, I'm just going to listen to music. And that's, that's all I've got to make noise for me. Mm, So, um, I try my best, but, uh, definitely what Aiden has at the gym is really awesome. Like I literally would love to have people that are genuinely hyping me up and genuinely, you know, whatever, or not yelling at me, trying to mess me up, you know, almost intentionally. Yeah, so, so it's, it's gonna it's gonna be organic. You can't be faking that sort of shit. No. Nah. Right. And and what happens is is like if I get it, it's so weird too. If I even get a small feeling that someone's faking it, it ruins it. I'm just like, you're not even like you're just making noise. It's not even fun anymore. Yeah. But if someone's like actually for real and actually like, bro, you got this, this is actually like I'm being for real, you have to go hit this type of thing. That's awesome. That's literally like the type of environment that you would want to be in. Yeah. So that's good. Not nah, cool. Well, um, mate, la- I think last question, do we expect to, um, do we expect to see you over this side of the world anytime soon or any sort of travel plans arrangements that you have? Oh man. That's hard. Um, so I'm not going to say that I don't like traveling. Um, I literally am just as weird as it sounds. I don't like, sitting for too long in any type of spot for too long in general, whether it be an airplane, whether it be a car, whether it be anything, I don't know why. Um, but my biggest hesitation on traveling really far is just because of how long it takes. Um, like I get, I don't know if I have ADHD or something, but I literally get antsy. Like I can't, um, you know, I just have to move and then I start getting paranoid and I start thinking that, my back's going to snap if I go try and squat things like that. <laughs> like all these, all these types of things just start entering my head and then it just ends up being like uh, less fun. And so do I want to go? Absolutely. I think it's a, I think it actually sounds like an awesome idea. Like I, I really want to go. Um, if, you, if you guys were closer, I'd probably been there already, but um, you guys are around the world. I think, uh, I don't know how long it takes. Maybe, 14 hour trip or something like that to get over there. Yeah. From LAX to Sydney, it's about 14 hours. Yeah. So it's 14 to Sydney. Right. But it takes me three to four hours to get to LAX. Yeah. So, you could, so be there. You could be tomorrow. Mate. I could be, I could be here tomorrow, but then it would be tomorrow after tomorrow because of you guys are already tomorrow. Yeah. So I would literally, uh, lose two days off my life going there. <laughs> <laughs> well, like so, um, you gain it going back. Yeah, <laughs> yep. I'm sure you. I'm sure you saw what um, uh, I think some of the junior boys did with Isaac Whistler. They um, they paid for his flights to come over the junior nationals. So I'll have a chat to all of the um, Australian D show clients. That being myself and the <laughs> other David, and we'll yeah. see what we can do. Mate. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All, all Jeez. yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. We'll, we'll wrap things up, but say for example, if anyone wanted to, to reach out to you, mate, how do they, uh, how do they get hold of you? Where do they get hold of you? And, um, I guess what can you offer if they're interested in coaching? Okay. So, um, you know, I'm a very simple person. I literally am the person to contact. I don't have an extra person. I don't even go by email. I literally go by communication. So Instagram is probably the actual best way to reach me. Um, if you ever find my email, there's no way to even reach me by email. I'm sure I would find it and be like, wow, I've totally missed out on this two or three months ago. <laughs> so email, I'm not super on it. Instagram, 
for coaching, Instagram is the place that I enter and do a lot of things. Best place is to message me for that as far as that goes. Coaching as far as I have no pro- I have no packages, I have no I have none of that. I'm literally just me. We're literally figuring things out you and I and that's kind of how I uh, you know I run that kind of, you know, business we would say. Um and so all you'd have to do is just simply reach out. Uh, Instagram handle dshell underscore uh, eleven. Pretty easy to, pretty easy to find. And uh, you know, uh, as far as coaching goes, I literally have no boundaries as far as level. Like uh, I've had people literally say, "Oh, I didn't ask you for coaching because I I thought you were only taking this type of athlete or this serious athlete or seriousness or of some sort." And for me, it doesn't even matter. You just have to be open to act to learning and then open to actually putting in the necessary time. If you're willing to learn, it just makes it more fun. Um, so, you know, it just makes the experience better for both of us. And we tend to just mesh better because I'm not very useful as just a program. You can just find that anywhere. So, um, but that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, why the, why the, uh, why the 11 in uh, your handle, mate? Oh my goodness. So actually that's the same as Dave. I made it when I was 15. Like I, I literally, I remember when Instagram first came out and I literally, literally was 16 or 17 or 15, maybe even. And like 11 was the year that I graduated high school. So I was like, Oh, D shell 11. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to do D shell underscore 11 super organic. You know, I, um, I just kept it just because I was like, don't care, you know, just nothing catchy. Just, it just became its own thing, you know, it just became its own catchphrase, I guess. <laughs> ah, cool. Good man. Oh, I thought it had something to do with how many toes you had or something. <laughs> oh my goodness. Whenever I found out that there's an actual toe thing in Australia, whenever you guys explain that to me, <laughs> I thought that was- Please expand. I googled that. I googled that. And is that fake? It's like, fake, I like, bro. I we, knew. We were trolling like, you. <laughs> what did you have like, There's you no say. way. <laughs> what? What? No, no. What was it? Um. Oh no, no, no. So David Hoffman, right? Yeah. He he has a missing big toe. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> and <laughs> the shop couldn't believe it. It was like holy fuck. And then I, I and then I just started doing. I'm like, yeah. Dave's just one of like those one in five Australians who unfortunately has a missing big toe. And Dave D Shell was just like, what the fuck? Like, are you serious? Is that a thing? I thought it was real though. I know I was like, because there are genetic deformities that exist in like certain types of people. And yeah. I was like, man, Australians don't have toes. <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's literally what I thought for like, Almost a week. I, I totally forgot. But like literally if someone asked me, I, I would have literally said, yeah, Australians don't have toes. That's so now so we'll, <laughs> I got oh. trolled pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. I, I totally forgot about that. And we actually didn't even get to like make sure you're all good about understanding that we're, we're actually normal people, mate. <laughs> no, like I definitely knew that you guys were normal people. But like I was like, kangaroos don't have five toes. So maybe <laughs> Australians... <laughs> don't have all the toes either i was like well yeah you know next thing uh, you're gonna sell me is is all all the girls over there have big pouches or something that you guys <laughs> sit in. and i'm like okay i'll believe that too oh my god i'll buy into that <laughs> that's so good far out <laughs> All right, well, thanks for coming on the um, the hunt, man. Like, yeah, we obviously appreciate your time. We understand how late it is over there, but it seems pretty normal to you. Um, yeah, no, nothing, nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'm definitely down, by the way, if you guys ever are doing more podcasts and people were just like, David's funny or something like that and or something, they we want David to come in for more stuff. Yeah, I'm yeah. totally down to I'm talk sure. about whatever, to do anything. So, cool. yeah, I, th- I think that would probably be the next angle. Maybe like, because Dave comes and visits heaps, obviously, because I have, his partner works for me. So, um, yeah, we might just do a three-way, mate, and that'll, that'll be good fun. I like how you guys call it partner. It's partner. And literally, whenever you guys first said partner, I was like, I, I thought it was like a work partner or like, no, you're talking about 
significant other. Yeah, yeah. the missus. <clears throat> right. We don't even say that. So it's like, I was so confused at first. I didn't even know that they were together. I literally did not even know that they were together. Oh my gosh. Like, Jay's going to hate that, mate. I didn't know. I it went literally clear over my head. I had no idea. Because you said my partner. I was like, I don't know. A, okay, partner. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. like, like we're like part- Woody, like Woody, Woody and Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. I understand. Like for us, we're partners. Yeah. It, but we're not partners. Partners. See, does that make sense? Like, I don't know. No, I get what you mean. <laughs> I get what you mean. All right, well, all these. We will um, we'll wrap things up, mate, but appreciate you on the show, right. and um, we hope to hear Absolutely. from you soon, all right? Yeah, all right. Peace out, man. Awesome.